is going to be on the next part of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. Do you think, can there be any more? Because we seem to have been doing the Sermon on the Mount for weeks and weeks, which we have, and it's, it's because it's just so rich, and it's actually the words of Jesus Christ speaking to us. This is the real thing. And it's hard to, to remember that sometimes. I said once before, so in some Bibles, Jesus' words are in red. And uh, that's quite significant, really, to, to pull out. Every bit of the word of God is important and valuable. But how wonderful that the Lord speaks to us through these verses. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 13, where we are taught how we can talk to the Lord God. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Before Jackie comes up to speak, let's just commit her and the words she will say in to prayer to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for Jackie as she comes up to speak about these wonderful words, that you would give her the words to say, that your Holy Spirit would inspire her and that we would receive her words with those things you would have us to learn today in Jesus name amen well good morning everybody good morning. nice to see you do keep your service sheet open uh, there so you can see the words that we're going to be looking at this morning Uh, I've got a question for you as, uh, as we start. Uh, I've got a few pictures here, and I'd like you to tell me what you think these have in common. What might these things have in common? We've got some very colourful vegetables. Uh, we've got a piggy bank. Uh, we've got a little recycling uh, symbol. We've got somebody having a, what looks like a very nice night's sleep, uh, a glass of water, somebody doing some exercise. And my slightly cryptic clue for those of a particular generation, we have E.T. And E.T. was famous for saying what? Phone home. Phone home. Uh, so what, um, what might these pictures have in common? Any thoughts? Healthy. That, somebody say they're healthy. Yeah, they're, they're, they are healthy. Uh, any, any reactions when you hear the idea that you should be healthy? Well, okay, I'll put you out your misery, I'll put myself out of your misery. Um, I look at those and go, actually, they're things that we often think we should be doing better at. <laughs> uh, perhaps there's a slight no-grade pang of guilt now, you've, I've told you that, but, you know, we're often told that we be, should be eating more vegetables, we should be getting our seven or eight hours sleep if we're going to be healthy, we should be drinking more water, we should be exercising, we should be saving, we should be recycling. And those of us of a particular generation, perhaps as students, 
We're often told that we should phone home more, and it's a lot easier now than when I was at university and used to have to find a payphone and a 10p to be able to phone home. But let me tell you, if you are a student, it doesn't get any better as you get older, you're still expected to phone <laughs> home at particular points. Um, it might be that your New Year's resolutions connect with some of these. You thought, oh, I must do some more exercise. That's my New Year's resolution. You know, uh, I must drink more, or I must sleep better, or whatever it might be. Or you might look at them and go, well, let's not talk about them. Uh, this is not the kind of thing we talk about at church. This is what I end up having to talk about with my GP, or my coach, or my mentor, or my wife, or whoever it might uh, be. Well, I wonder if this image belongs in that uh, little montage as well, because I suspect that for many Christians, there is a low-grade sense of guilt about our prayer lives. We feel that we should be doing more of it. We're slightly awkward talking about it. And that can be true even of mature Christians. So I don't know if any of you ever read the publication, monthly publication called Evangelicals Now, and uh, every month they do a interview with a leader, it's church leaders, leaders of mission organisations, and uh, they put the same 10 questions to them. And question three is normally, describe your prayer life. And here are some of the answers from 2023. Uh, all anonymous, all right? I'm not going to name names. January, a battle. Personal discipline is hard. February, consistent, but less than it should be. Above all, lacking in passion for the Lord's glory and the salvation of the lost. March, I find prayer is a battle. I'm easily distracted when I'm on my own. April, better than it once was, but not yet what I desire it to be. July, intoxicated by my own self-sufficiency. One out of the 11 that I read last year had a strikingly different perspective. May, in Jesus, flawless. In my day-to-day -day life, up and down. You see, for most of those who were being interviewed, there was a gulf between what they know they are invited into in Jesus and how that is being worked out in life even in the face of lots of good theology or doctrine. And I expect that if we uh, asked the same question here, we'd probably find the same range of answers. So before we step into the passage, can I ask you not to get caught up with the amount of praying that you're doing at the moment? Not to let guilt or awkwardness or embarrassment or comparison act as a muffler to what Jesus wants to say to us. To just put aside any sense of, if I knew it was on prayer, I might have been going for a walk this morning. I wouldn't have chosen to come to a seminar on prayer. All that slight discomfort that you're already feeling that one of your New Year's resolutions might have been, I'm going to have more regular quiet times. And what are we? January the 14th. And we're thinking, oh my word, how am I doing? So we're going to do something slightly different this morning at different points in uh, our time together. I'm going to press the pause button and I, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds, and I know that can feel a long time to sit in silence at times, but just 30 seconds to bow your head and listen to the Lord and speak to the Lord. So here's the first one. Uh, as we begin, is there anything that will hinder you from hearing this morning? Anything that will hinder you from hearing the words of the Lord on prayer? Let's just take a few moments in silence. You might just want to bow your head, you might want to look back at the passage if you're uncomfortable with that. Well, just like last week, our passage begins with the words, when you, 
when you pray. It's not if, there is an assumption that you will be praying. And Jesus' words are there to encourage us to pray, to, to draw us into prayer in a way that makes us go, oh, yes, please, Jesus, yes, please. Now, prayer was part of the religious life for uh, the Jews. Um, they would have prayed probably three times a day. If you think back to Daniel, uh, who in Daniel 6.10, it is noted that he withdraws to pray and pray openly, even though it has been forbidden. But if that's for the Jews, what is it to be like for a follower of Jesus? What's it like to be uh, in the kingdom and to be praying? Now, it seems to me as we come to these words, Jesus is instructing the disciples, not so they become self-conscious and awkward, so they follow something that is restrictive to them, but so they recognise the dynamic of prayer. They recognise that it's possible to be mistaken in the way they pray, but also to acknowledge that Jesus shapes the uh, the way their prayer life is to develop. What does it look like to pray with an audience of one? So, we have to start with, in the first few verses, uh, Jesus highlighting the fact that there are two mistakes that the disciples might observe in others, which they are to avoid. So look back at the passage and look into verses 5 to 8. And the first one that Jesus pulls out is that they aren't to pray to impress people. Verses 5 and 6. Let's read those verses again. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So this first lesson is a lesson from the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. And at first sight, if a disciple spotted this Pharisee, they might think, look, there's lots to mimic or model there. They love to pray, tick. They love to pray appropriately. They are standing, tick. They seem to be breaking down the secular and spiritual divide. They pray both in the synagogue and on the street corner, tick, tick. But what the disciple might be observing in the piety and spiritual fervor of the Pharisee is not what Jesus sees. Jesus says, don't be like the Pharisees. Why? Because they are hypocrites. The audience they pray to is not God, but to everybody else. You see, it isn't actually that they love praying, or even that they love the God they're talking to. They just love themselves. They pray to be seen by others. They want the applause. They want the affirmation. And when they get that, that is their reward. And so what is a follower of Jesus to do instead? Well, a follower of Jesus is to withdraw from the public eye. Verse 6, when you pray, you go into a room, into your room. Now, interesting, the Greek there means a storeroom, often a storeroom where treasure might have been kept. I'm not sure whether there's an implication there of, of the preciousness of what will happen when you go into that room, the treasure that awaits you. But why are they to withdraw? They are to withdraw because they are coming to the God who sees everything. They are to pray not for the acclaim of others, but to know this God. And in those moments, what is their reward? Well, they're told their reward will come from God, not from others. Their reward, I'm sure, will be that sense of the spirit witnessing with their spirit that they are children of God, that they can cry out, Abba, Father, and be heard, to know the blessing of the one who will make his face shine upon them. You see, kingdom people pray because they know God 
and secrecy or privacy see here seems to purify their motives. Well, how might we build this into our pattern of prayer? Is it that we have to have uh, a secret room somewhere in the house that we can go to and that's the only place that we can, we can pray in? Well, it might be that some of you do have a particular location in your house that you go to, to pray to. That's the place you go. It's a chair, it's a room, perhaps it's a walk that you go on, perhaps it's when you've got your earphones in and everybody looks at you and knows that you're not to be talked to at this point. Wasn't it uh, Charles Wesley's mum that used to sit with her, she used to pull her apron across over her head and the children knew that when mum was, had the apron over her head, that was her in her moments of prayer not to be disturbed. But I suspect it isn't so much about location for us now, but it is about secrecy and privacy. It is about withdrawal. And particularly important in an age where everything seems to be posted on social media, where people cannot live without likes where we're searching for affirmation from others, that actually at the very core of our personal prayer is that withdrawal, that secrecy, that privacy, that engaging with God, who is our Father. So does that mean we're cancelling all church prayer meetings? Because actually the blessing is prayer on our own. Well, no. Um, I don't think Jesus is barring collective prayer or public prayer because these are clearly modelled elsewhere in scripture. Just think what the disciples and the women were doing after Jesus ascended. They were gathered in a room together praying. But I do think it means that actually we recognise the difference that there is a different element in public prayer. When we pray on behalf of others, when we're focused on serving them and being intelligible in a way that allows them to say amen, there is a different dynamic going on. And therefore, those of us who pray frequently in public do have to hear Jesus' words of warning here that we keep our eyes fixed on the one we are praying to. So pray for those who lead the bands and pray. Pray for the preachers. Pray for service leaders. Pray for the elders and councils. Pray for your life group leaders. Pray for those who are used to praying in public that they keep their eyes fixed on the one that they are coming to and are not praying for the sake of others. Well, if that's the first one, here is the second mistake. Don't pray to impress people. Secondly, don't pray to impress God. Don't pray to impress God. Verses 7 and 8. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Don't babble. Isn't that a great word? Isn't babble a great word? Uh, It's actually a unique word here. It's a unique word that's not used elsewhere in scripture. But I think it's a wonderful word because the sound just kind of fits the meaning. See, the disciples are not to be like the pagans who use many words. And I immediately think of those prophets of Baal who had that encounter with Elijah. But they're not to use many words and somehow thinking they can manipulate God or nag God into submission through a deluge of words. They're not to be like that whining child who thinks if they keep nagging long enough at just that right annoying pitch that their parent would capitulate and give in to their request. Now, given the uniqueness of this word, other translations don't uh, translate it babbling, but translate it vain repetition. And perhaps that gives another dimension to the meaning. It gives this idea of we're not to, not just to not utter meaningless words, but we're not to go through kind of mechanical expressions. It's not just about the quantity of words. It's also not about having an impressive technique or style. So today, how does that apply to us? Well, using a great English phrase, I think it means we're not to rabbit on. And if you don't know what rabbit on means, well, look it up in Google, and then I dare you to try and get it into a sentence this week. 
Uh, but we aren't to just rub it on. It means to go on and on and on. But it also means that actually if we're used to using other forms of written prayer or liturgy, we're not to use it mindlessly. See, we don't need to babble. We can be thoughtful in our requests because God is a father who knows our needs and knows our needs even before we ask. He is not ignorant needing information, so we just need to keep repeating it just to make sure he's got it. Well, whilst we're not meant to rab it on, I don't think it means that we can't ask for something more than once. We are to be persistent in prayer. We are to allow other scriptures to speak to us in this because Jesus prayed how many times in Gethsemane that the cup would be removed from him? Three times. Paul prayed multiple times for the thorn to be removed. There was freedom to pray again and again. It's just the means of words that we're not to be using. So... Two sharp contrasts, two mistakes to avoid, and two contrasts as we begin. On the one hand, we have the Pharisees who are praying in a, a selfish and a showy way. Jesus' followers are to be secret and godly. We have the pagans praying in a meaningless and mechanical way. Jesus' followers are to be thankful and confident. Well, a second quick pause. Which of those mistakes might you be prone to? Are you a babbler? Or are you showy? Or perhaps there's another mistake in your prayer life. Just for a moment, let's pause, bow our heads and reflect. So what is the antidote to these mistakes? Jesus goes on to give his disciples a form of praying, a way of praying that I think doesn't automatically protect them or protect us even from those mistakes because I'm sure we can pray the Lord's Prayer to be seen by others and we can pray it without engaging our brain. But rightly engaged with, this prayer expresses the kingdom. It gives us a sense of being shaped by Jesus. Now, is it a set prayer or is it a model prayer? Yes, I think is my answer. It is both and. I think it is to be repeated. Jesus teaches it twice uh, in his ministry. And why would we reject words given by Jesus? And for those of us who come from a kind of non-conformist tradition, I suspect we don't pray these words often enough because we're not following a prayer book or a liturgy. And because we don't pray it collectively, we often perhaps don't pray it in our personal, private lives either. But I think it's also a pattern for our extemporary prayer because it gives us a perspective of who God is and his priorities. So let's dig into it for our last few moments uh, together. You see, at the heart, the wrong approaches to God, the mistaken, uh, had a mistaken view of God. He had been shrunk or diminished. In the first instance, the Pharisees shoved him out of the way and put themselves at the centre. And in the second one, the pagans had this idea that they could please God by merely babbling on or uh, pleasing him by ritual. Now, it's really important that we do not shrink God, that we do not have a mistaken view of God as we come to pray, that we don't make him a lesser version of himself. We don't make him into some kind of religious version of Father Christmas in the sky or a therapist that we're approaching or we get so matey with God that basically he would be the kind of guy that we would eat pizza with. We need to come to God as he reveals himself. And so Jesus says in verse 9, as you pray, you should say, our Father in heaven. Now, can I just say, I realise for some of us, this is not the most motivating start point. Because our experience of our earthly father has been such that it triggers a vision of someone who is absent or domineering, or cold, 
or even abusive. That's the case for you. Well, firstly, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that that has been your experience. I wish it had been different for you. And I trust that the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, is entering into those wounds. And yet, even in the depths of your disappointment, you have an inkling of what a good father is like. Even those of us who have fathers with a better track record know that they are imperfect and only a shadow of this father. And so of all the names that we could use of God, and it is appropriate to call on God in his different names in prayer, this is our starting point, to come to him as our father. And in doing so, we, we just see Jesus' prayer. We echo Jesus' prayer. Father litters his approach to God in John 17 as he prays for himself and the disciples and then us. It's the way we hear him approach God when he's crying out in anguish in Gethsemane. It's the way even on the cross when he's praying for others, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so just as Jesus approaches God as Father, we approach him as Father in the confidence that gives us that he loves us as a child, that he loves us in his own beloved son. But notice as well that he is our father in heaven. And that's not merely a geographical location like saying Jackie lives in Reading. It's pointing to the reality of his reign, that he is sovereign, that he rules. And so in the freedom that we have to say Abba, Father, we are not reducing him to just a slightly better version of ourselves. And then Jesus teaches them uh, by dividing the prayer into two sets of three uh, petitions. The first ones we have here in verses 9 to 10. Petitions that revolve around his name, his kingdom, and his will. They are all about God's glory. They are praying that his name would be hallowed. And that's not that Jesus, uh, God has to be made more holy. It's actually that all that is summed up in his name, his character and his actions, that those things would be honoured, that he would be glorified. Praying that his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, God is obviously king and has always been king, even when Adam and Eve rejected him. There was never a point that the, the throne room of heaven was vacant. And yet, and yet that is not the experience that we see on earth at the moment. Earth does not mirror what's being worked out in heaven. And so the disciples are to pray that actually his kingdom would be extended Pray for a greater visibility of what occurs in heaven now to break in on earth. And that will come as people of all ages, tongues and backgrounds come to Christ and live for him. It seems to me, and I don't know how many words there, you can count them quickly, but probably less than 20, we are praying some very profound desires. And we are placing ourselves, as those early disciples did, right in the midst of these requests. Just think what we are praying when we pray these words. We are asking that our lives might give glory to God, to God's actions and characters. We're asking that our lives might be lived in obedience to his will. We're asking that we might proclaim Jesus as king and that people will hear of his salvation and be saved. We're asking that he will come again and bring that final revelation of his kingdom in restoration and judgment. Brothers and sisters, we cannot pray this prayer as if it was just out there. We cannot pray this prayer and should not pray this prayer mindlessly or hastily because we are saying it's your name, it's your kingdom, it's your will. These are big, big prayers. 
So let me ask you, are those reflected in your prayers at the moment? Your will, your name, your kingdom. Let's take a few seconds to reflect on that. Well then, finally, we have a shift in verse uh, 11. It goes from your to our, from your to our. We've gone from your name and your kingdom to your will, and now we are going to come to our provision, our pardon, and our protection. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This section of the prayer, Jesus enables us to bring our very reality into God's presence. These are the big themes of life, aren't they? Physical, spiritual, moral, daily bread. Well, in those days, in the days before fridges and freezers, life was much more precarious. Bread would have been acquired daily. There was a tangible sense that God sustained life through his care. For many, though not all of us now, we no longer wonder where the next meal would be coming from. We open the fridge or the freezer, we know where the supermarket is. But whilst we may be removed by a few steps from the production of food, this still holds true. We are finite we are dependent upon God who holds all things together. He may now choose to provide for us through our wage packets or uh, our, the supermarkets or the fridge or the pension, but he is still the provider. Forgive us. Forgive us. We may be disciples, they may have been disciples, but they still sin daily. And this prayer acts as a reality check. We're going to think more of this next week as we think about what it is to forgive others. But just for today, I suppose my comment is that I suppose as we become more attuned to praying your name, your kingdom, your will, we become increasingly aware when we are out of step with God's purposes, when we sin and that conviction then comes not for condemnation, but that we might seek forgiveness. And as we seek and are given forgiveness, we become those who are able to give forgiveness to others. Uh, I have just, I've just finished this book, uh, Tim Keller's book on, called Forgive. Uh, I found that really, really helpful. If you want to come and have a look at it. Um, just on the issue of how are we able to forgive others as well as receive forgiveness. And he's especially strong on this idea of how sin creates a debt that we have to forgive. So I commend that to you. But we're going to be looking more, and I won't still, I think it's Phil, it Phil next week. I'm not going to still feel thunder on that one. Lead us not into temptation. Temptation is that experience of all Christians may come in different ways, at different stages. It may be subtle, it may be fierce, but we are not Teflon-coated. And we need to be realistic that we come and ask that we might not be led into temptation, we might not face temptation that we cannot endure, and that we will be rescued from the devil. Well, there's much in there. We've whizzed through it. And as I uh, close, I want to just come to... A particular image that I think this prayer helps us um, ground our vision of what we are doing when we pray. So uh, 16th century mathematician who proposed that the sun, the earth revolved around the sun and the earth was not static and uh, with all the planets moving around the earth. Anybody know his name? You're good, you're good. Anyway, uh, I think that was quite a revolutionary step at the time. Caused a bit of a ripple out there, this idea that the earth wasn't the centre of everything. 
I think the Lord's Prayer and his teaching on prayer should be that revolutionary to our prayer life. Because often we put ourselves at the centre of our prayer life, just like they used to put the earth at the centre of the theory of how the planets worked. But actually, this prayer puts God at the centre. Tim Chester, in his book, How to Pray, says, actually, if you have a small view of God, if self is at the centre, then our prayers will stay small because they just focus on our needs. If we have a big view of God, with God at the centre, then our prayers will become big and we will grow. Well, I think that's a mo- this is a model of that, and may it be so for us as individuals and as a church at Wycliffe. Let's pray. And pause and respond to what God has said to us. Brothers and sisters, know that God the Father loves to hear us pray. God the Son has make, is making every prayer pleasing to God. And God the Holy Spirit helps us as we pray. As we step into a new week, may we know that God is on our side and has made it possible for us to pray. Amen.